you know, this guy has, has a giant heart for missions and for, you know, uh, the Lord's work uh, here at home and overseas. And thank you for his passion and also his networking is incredible. So let's give our senior pastor, Pastor Terry, a hand, everyone. Woo thank you, Freeman. And Freeman has been such an awesome missions director. Uh, I still remember 18 years ago, he told he asked me if, if, if I've thought about who the missions director for this church is, and I said, I haven't. And then he says, uh, me, I volunteer for that position. I just see the passion in him. And so, as you can see, it, it's still burning, his passion, right, after 18 years. Okay, we're going we're gonna to do see, uh, look at um, missions from a biblical perspective, and we should do it that way, right? So let's pray for this part. Heavenly Father, I pray that you open our hearts to your word. Lord, thank you for the icebreaker that we just enjoyed. And uh, there are many reasons why we may want to go on a missions trip. But Lord, let us look into the Bible and see what you have to say so that, Lord, we can align ourselves with your word. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, first, let me just establish the biblical basis of missions. So if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. We're going to have all the passages on the on the screen anyways, okay? So a very popular passage when it comes to missions teaching is found in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And it reads, then Jesus came to them, and them are his disciples. Okay, is, every, is everybody here a disciple? Amen, right? You're a disciple, right? You're a follower of Jesus. So this would apply to us, okay? So Jesus came to us, I'll say it that way to personalize it, and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this is one of the records of Jesus giving what they call the Great Commission. It's not the only one. This is the most familiar one. When you ask a lot of Christians, where is the Great Commission found? They'll say Matthew chapter 28. But the Great Commission also is found in the other Gospels at the end and in the book of Acts. So actually, it's recorded five times. But there's different um, portions of it that's revealed from the different Gospel writers. Okay. Now, the emphasis in this particular one are on the four verbs that we see. And many of you have have been um, exposed to my teaching on this. We got four verbs, and what are they? Just yell it out. There's four verbs in go, meet disciples, baptizing, teaching. Those are the four verbs, okay? Now, if we really want to know what a passage is all about, we go to Pastor Chia and ask him what the Greek is, okay? Because we know Pastor Chia, you know, he, he's been educated in Greek. Well, in the Greek, these four words, these four verbs, um, one is the main verb, and the other three are what they call ex auxiliary supporting verbs, okay? The main verb is make disciples, okay? Make disciples. That's what Jesus wants us to do in the Great Commission. The other three, go, as though that's what's in English, is actually going in the Greek, okay? So to make a disciple, you have to be doing some going, hence one of our three-pronged approach to, to mission, going. So you're going to tell people about Jesus. You have to do some teaching from the word. And for them to become a full disciple, they also have to be baptized. So to make a disciple, there has to be some going, teaching, and baptizing. That's what it's trying to say here. Okay? So, but the, the thing is to make disciples. And that's why I'm really excited this year that we're putting a lot of emphasis into the make disciples part. If we don't, people relatively speaking, can get saved pretty easily, okay? And, I, and of course, you know, you may say, well, it's easy to get saved. Well, it's easy to get saved as opposed to getting them discipled, okay? Um, if you look worldwide evangelism, um, when people get saved, only 90, only 10% will actually stay saved and be going to a church after one year. So that shows how difficult it is to stay saved. It's relatively easy to get saved. Okay? It's easy in a crusade, in a friend day that we do, and we ask people, who wants to accept Jesus? The hands go up. But 
One year later, are the same hands still in the church? Or is they, do they know more about the Bible? Okay? Are they members of a church? Okay? 90% actually leave. So that tells you something right there that, that it's difficult to stay safe. And, and it is across the board. That's why the Bible even tells us to work out your salvation with trembling. Because although it's easy to get saved, to stay safe. And, and that's the thing about the enemy. The enemy, after you get saved, he really cranks up all the temptation and the persecution and the trials that we receive. Why? Because he wants us to be part of that 90% that leave. Okay? That's why in this church, for this year, we're really putting a lot of effort into the discipleship part. Um, um, the latest news is that um, um, last Thursday, or the Thursday before, uh, we had our No, the one before, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, we had our, aunt, our we had our quarterly Presbyterian meeting for the Assemblies of God, and Crystal Marin was one of the candidates who was interviewed by the Presbytery, and she passed, and so she's going to be, yeah. So in on mark this date on April first, on April first, okay. And this is not a Fool's Day okay, statement, okay. I heard that, you know, April 1st is, is uh, yeah, April Fool only in the morning. It expires by noontime. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's how the tradition goes, okay? So if you want to lie, you lie before noon. That's, that's the whole thing, okay? You want to fool people and all that. But the ordination serves at night, so Fool Days is off, okay? Anyways, Crystal will be recognized as Reverend Crystal Marin on the evening of April 1st. So... So make time to go to First Assembly. That's where the service is going to be held. And she will be among uh, quite a few people who will be credentialed as ministers for the Assembly of God. Okay, but um, because of her credentialing, she will be added to the pastoral staff at Calvary. And her main portfolio is discipleship. And the reason is because it's part of this great commission. is that the ultimate thing you do in missions is to make a disciple. That's why on a mission trip, it's not just about saving people. Okay, we get this, this um, stereotype that when we go on a mission trip, if we don't save anybody, we're unsuccessful. Okay? Remember, that's kind of overrated in the sense that 90% are going to fall away anyway. What's more important is to make disciples. That's what this is trying to say. That's why on a mission trip, it's okay to encourage the current believer. It's okay to, to, to strengthen the leaders. In fact, that's one of the best things that can happen on a mission trip. Why? Because you're making disciples. You're making disi stronger disciples out of the leaders that they in turn then can grow, uh, uh, grow the people in that country. See, you can't unless you are willing to sign up for a, a one-year or longer mission trip. You know, Crystal was on. Pastor Israel was on. You know, they, they were on for a, a lot longer, right? Karen was the longest, actually. Okay? And uh, in fact, just to announce that, there's going to be a hero's lunch for her in March. Yeah, just to recognize that for almost five years, right? How many months short are you of five years? Calculate it. So you, you did hit five years. A little bit more. Wow. That's why we're going to hold a hero's lunch for her, okay? It's the Mission Sunday in March, okay? Don't miss that one either, okay? But see, they've been on long term, and when you're there long term, you actually can meet disciples. You can read because you're there long enough. That's why. Okay? But if you're only there for one week or even two weeks, that's why a lot of theologians will say, a lot of pastors will say that you will grow more than the people that you reach out to. You will change more than the people that you reach out to. You see? Okay? So if you're going to grow more and your time there is kind of limited, then you need to try to maximize what you do. And if you go and, and say you do street witnessing, I'm not saying this is a waste of time at all. Okay? But you can, you can try to lead somebody on the street, but if there's no follow-up, it's almost guaranteed that that 90%, or actually 100%, will kick in. That is, they'll just fall away. Nobody following up on them. Okay? Now, if you align with the church, which we always try to do on our missions trip, align with the local church, then that, that church can follow up. Okay? But what's even better is to actually speak into the leadership of that church Raise them up because see, they lack the resources we do. They don't have Bible colleges like we do. They don't have like like teaching type professors and pastors like we do. 
and you do. I mean, you are, what you receive in church, I don't know if you know this, the, the typical Christian in a third world country doesn't even get 10% of what you get. Sometimes we think, well, oh, Pastor Terry Sherry was born this one. Oh, that Sunday school lesson, man, that didn't teach me much of that. You are getting 10 times more than what most, people, most Christians in the world. So we need to kind of appreciate that. Okay, I'm not trying to be unfair. You know, I'm just trying to tell you that. I, I'm trying to help you see a perspective here. What you get, it's not just materialistically and everything else that comes with America, even Bible learning, you get more of that, an order of magnitude more than anybody else, other Christians outside. So here you are. You're on a mission trip. You've got this learning. And even though you may think that you're still a baby Christian, you don't know that much and all that, you know a lot more than probably the, the people that you're going to. That's where you can be part, you see, making disciples, okay? Now, there's also another part to the Great Commission, Acts 1.8. It says here, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Jude Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So now, this is the Pentecostal part of mission, okay? It's saying that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, so when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, then you will be my witnesses both, okay? Both because it means locally and remotely. So locally would include your Jerusalem, that's the city you live in, Judea, the, 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 the state, if you will, uh, Samaria, the, 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 you know, the outer islands of Hawaii, and, and to the end of the earth. So you got the local, you got the remote. When you're doing missions, when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you should be mindful of what's happening locally and remotely, you see? It's not just you're on a mission trip when you're when you when you board a plane. You're on a mission trip when you walk across the street. You're on a mission trip when you walk across the cubicle in a workplace. That's that's a mission trip right there. Okay? Is it, you may not think that, but it is because they need salvation as well. Okay? But you need the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's why even the, the thing about seeing Jesus, uh, uh would you rather see him do a miracle, you'd rather hear his preaching and all that? Well, I, I'm with a lot of you. I I'd rather not have to choose. I want it all. Yeah, you know what I'm just saying? But see, there's something to be said about the miracles too because miracles do lead to salvation. And that's the model that we see in the book of Acts. That's, you know, kind of the crux of, of my doctoral paper that I'm writing. And, and we, even in practice, when we, when we do miracles, and, uh, you know, I think about the Thailand tr um, team last year. There were a lot of miracles that, that they were a part of. And people, you know, it affects people's faith. If, if Free believers see that kind of stuff, it will move them towards believing Jesus. And that's the model that we see in the book of Acts here, okay? But the point here is that mission should be both locally and remotely, okay? Now, that, that, that leads us to something here. I'm going to point out three different churches that we see in, in the book of Acts here, okay? And I'm going to use these three churches to show you kind of a little bit of the progression that Calvary has gone through in the last 18 years, okay? The first church is the Jerusalem church, okay? The Jerusalem church. If this was a sermon, this would be point number one right here, okay? Everything else I said was just introduction, okay? If this was a sermon. No, sorry. Okay, Acts 2, 42 to 47. It reads here, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Does this sound like a pretty healthy church? What I just read. They're doing a lot of good things here, right? You know, they... There, there's a lot of good teaching because the apostles are teaching. There's good fellowship, it says. The, the Greek word here, koinonia. They, they had Super Bowl parties, although no 49ers and Chiefs back in that day, right? Um, there are one, signs and wonder, miracles, that I was talking about there. The miracles were operating in the church. I mean, this is a Pentecostal church. They were all together. There was unity, had everything in common. Okay, so they were, they were together here. They sold property and possession give, and to give to anyone who had need. They knew something about doing mission giving. You know, wow, right? They so this is like mission conference, and let's just whoever wants to give. Well, you know, I have some property. I'll give into the missions fund. I have some 
some, some valuable jewelry, and I'll give that to anyone who has need, you know? They continued to meet together in temple court. They had church, okay? They broke bread in their home. They had cell. So the celebration and cell, you know, you're going to hear something about that tomorrow, by the way. And, and then they ate. I mean, what kind of a church can, you know, uh, what kind, is there a, such a church with no potluck, right? You know, we just had one on Wednesday, right, watching Josh Swiger win, he's healthy now, you know, win Jeopardy, like, whoa, you know. Um, and praising God, they know how to worship, enjoying the favor of all the people. What that means is that they were had a good reputation among the community. The church, the, the, the neighborhood knew about them. And the result of that is that the Lord added to their number daily who were being saved. What a healthy sounding church, and what a great bunch of fruit that's going on. Jerusalem was the first church. And part of that, it was the nation of Israel. Okay? Now, Jesus had just ascended. He had empowered them, 120 disciples. They met together in the upper room. They all received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. People heard them speak in tongues, multitudes all around. And Peter preached an incredible sermon. And then 3,000 got saved. This is the Jerusalem church. Right away, now, on our day one of this first church, 3,120 people were in the church. 120 disciples, 3,000 who got saved. Okay? This church became the mother church of future churches. This church was a praying church. This church was a giving church. However, this church, if there's one thing that's missing here, it really wasn't a going church. Okay? They're praying, giving, but they really weren't going. I mean, they were growing, they were glowing, but they really weren't going. I steal that line from Pastor Jack Haynes, okay? He likes to say that. And the reason is, yes, they were going in a community, as I read, but they weren't going beyond Jerusalem. They weren't going beyond the Jewish community. In fact, if Peter was a senior pastor, and that's debatable, by the way, okay, because it was actually a group of, of pastoral staff for this first church. But if Peter was the senior pastor, let's say, he still has some prejudice issues. And we know about it because later on, a few chapters later, we read that that it was revealed that he still had things against the Gentiles and, you know, the non-Jews and all that, okay? So they weren't, prior to, Jesus had already told them, including Peter, you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. So the locals come and they go, yeah, yeah, amen. And to the ends of the earth. I'm sure Peter did not say amen when Jesus said that. He's probably going, okay, that's for somebody not me, because I don't associate with people. They're dirty. They're, they're just filthy people. You know? I mean, that's, that was his prejudice, right? And that's why Jesus had to deal with him when he was on the rooftop at the house that Brother Joe and I saw in, you know, over in, in Joppa there, right? We, we were there, you know, last year in Israel, right? And, and the, the Lord had to deal with them. But see, at this point, they weren't a going church yet. Because a true going church doesn't just reach out to the neighborhood. It goes beyond. He didn't want to do that, you see? So this, this, this church was limited th this way. And I, and I think about Calvary. Um, when we first start missions, Freeman and I, together with this church, um, uh, we, we, we taught the church how to pray for missionaries. We supported missionaries, uh, as though we didn't necessarily go out there. In fact, definitely, we did not do any long-term stuff, right? If anything, uh, we learned how to give. In fact, you know, I still remember uh, the first few years, we were trying to break the 100,000 mark, and we did in two years. Broke that, and then we, we you know, a uh, quarter million, and 300,000, 400,000, and, and, and I, and then around that time, I remember um, Pastor Rick Seward came, and, and actually he was one of our conference speakers. Of course, he's the pastor of that mega church in, in Singapore, right? Victory Family Center. And, um, and, and what's that? Yeah, he died, of course, a few years ago. And um, anyways, I remember he, he, he sat down, had lunch with us, and he said, you know, you guys are doing a great job with praying and giving, but you got to work on the going part. And we thought, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, we, we're planning short-term mission trips and all that, right? And, and, and he says, no, 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 I'm not talking about short-term. That's easy. I'm talking about long-term. What's long-term? Two weeks? Three weeks? Right? No, 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 no. One year. He said, One year? How can we do that? He said, he showed me, showed me some stats. That a hundred member church can send out four to six people in one year. I said, oh, I don't think my people give up a year. How do you know that? He 
unless you take the call. I said, well, I don't know about that. You know, now I don't know if I want to lose them for a year, right? And then he said to me, you will lose some of them for three years. Three years? You know, and, and, and honestly, I was thinking, okay, who can I get rid of for three years? That's what I was thinking. Who can I get rid of for three years? And then he says to me, who you send out for three or more years have to be some of your best people. I said, I don't want to lose my best people. And he said, you don't want to send out junk. You send out junk, you'll get junk. And then your people won't believe in your missions program anymore. You can send your best out there. And I go, oh, dear, you know, I'm going to do this thing and all that. And the first opportunity was East Timor. Remember that, Brother Freeman? And, 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 and there was an in on him because he, he was just voted in as the chairman of Love Singapore, which is an organization with all the, the churches in Singapore, which included you know, other mega churches too, uh, like, like um, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Down TV, I forgot. New Creation. He's the pastor of New Creation. Joseph Prince. Joseph Prince and Kongi, you know, with City Harvest, and all these mega church, right? And Pastor Rick was, was voted in as the, the uh, chairman, right? And so their first initiative, Love Singapore, was to send in churches into East Timor because East Timor had just been ravished by the Indonesians. I mean, there was a mass, mass murders and everything. And the buildings were all uh, destroyed and that type of thing. And so there was a rebuilding project. And Love Singapore was asked to be, to, 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 to hit, spearhead that. And so here's Pastor Rick was the chairman of it. So what the country was asking for is can you send people in to help rebuild all the, the town the town centers and the town squares, all that stuff. And of course, you know, Pastor Rick said, sure, because he's thinking bringing, sending Christians, sending churches. So we were asked to be part of that. And so I remember I asked our church, you know, it, you know, there's nobody here that wants to go for one year, right? You know, I, mean, I didn't say it that way, but I was thinking that way, right? You know, and I was surprised because some people actually volunteered. You know, I was like, no, how can you give up one year and all that in my mind? See, again, because I was, I was kind of Peterish. You know, I was just thinking local. I didn't want to think remote. And, and um, that's when Brother Sheldon actually volunteered. And that's where he, see, and Pastor Dora had wanted to go to, wanted to be sent out for a long term, for the longest time, but she knew that she cannot unless Freeman, I mean, unless Sheldon also, you know, because as a husband, right, the head of the household, right? And it was that time when his heart changed when he was on at East Timor. And so when the opportunity for Brazil came up, he was on the opposite side. You know, see, so God kind of worked all that, right? But I still remember, boy, for me to, and, and then when Brazil opportunity came up, I couldn't believe Karen, Crystal, and Israel, they all wanted to, to, to go as well, and and, and, you know, minimally one year, and then it, and then one year turned into two years, and three years, and five years here, and Pastor Doris has been there for seven years now. Wow. You know, and now my face is totally different. Before, I thought, we can't do that. And let's face it, Pastor Dora, one of the best disciples ever, you know, uh, 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 developed in this church, right? And, and that's why. Because if we had sent junk out there, there'd be junk in this church. Right? In fact, it wouldn't have lasted. They say that one out of 30 church plans survive. Okay, one out of 30, that's a stat. And, and we, we've been there for seven years now, right? Last year, we built a church building, you know, and, 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 and people are like, wow, right? Good thing we didn't send out junk, right? And I believe that you guys are not junk. The fact that you're here, who knows what God could do with your life, right? Maybe five years, maybe, you know, working for Pastor Terry for five years over here, you know, or, or a youth pastor over there. You never know what God will do. These are last days. We've got to be prepared. So that's what happened to us. We were like the Jerusalem church, but then, thank God for a second church here, the Antioch church. Point number two, the Antioch church. Acts chapter 11, verse 19 to 30. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their heart. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, one year, 
whole year, not one week, for a whole, this is a long-term uh, uh, mission trip here for, for, for Saul and Barnabas. Saul, by the way, is the Jewish name for Paul, which is his Roman name, okay? Saul and Paul, same, same person. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius, the emperor. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by the Barnabas, by Barnabas and Saul. So here's his church, okay? The result of Jerusalem, okay? Jerusalem was, remember, the first church. In, in, in history, first church in Jerusalem. That's the mother church. That's the mega church, okay? And then came Antioch. This church was also a praying church, as we can read. You know, that, 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 that people are healed and all that. This was definitely a giving church because the last part I just read, there was this famine in the land. There were people in Judea that were a need. So this Antioch church raised the funds. People gave to help those in Judea, okay? But... This was also a going church because we read that, that they sent out different people. Paul was, was, was the first one, actually, because following this, we, we read a couple of chapters later that Paul and, and a number of people, John, Mark, and, and Luke, and a number of people were sent out on the first missions trip out of Antioch. So here was a church that was exercising the three-pronged approach to missions, praying, giving, and going. They weren't just concerned about their own immediate vicinity. They were also going out into the world. And I think about, you know, after Pastor Rick, you know, encouraged us and all that, um, Calvary here in Honolulu is like our Jerusalem, and Calvary, Brazil is like our Antioch. From our Antioch, from out of the, the, the Brazil work, and you hear uh, um, uh, um, Crystal talk about it, you'll see that from there, now we're branching out, okay? Amazon, for example. Amazon is being reached out, not by us. It's being reached out to by our church that's in Seattle. Okay, that's the, the, the state that we're in. And you'll see that that's what's going on. And, and the same thing was happening here. See, Antioch was the, the planted church by Jerusalem. But from them, they now sent out more. You see? And so that's what we're doing now in Brazil. There's a third church now. The Philippi church. The Philippi church. Let me read Philippians 4. 15 to 19. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I receive full payment, have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing God, and my God will meet all your needs, Jehovah Jireh, according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Okay, so review. Jerusalem, the mother church. The result of that, Antioch, which became the missions church. Giving, uh, praying, giving, and going. Out of Antioch, now Paul and missions teams are sent out, and the result of that is the church in Philippi. In fact, what happened there, on a, just a, it was a short-term short mission trip. They went into Philippi, and they, they, saw, uh, they, they, they saw this, this person who was demonized, and, 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 and that demonized woman kept on harassing Paul and, and Silas, and, and finally they couldn't take it anymore, and so the Paul just cast out the, the demon. Well, the, the demonized woman was owned by, by people were making money from her all her predictions because, you know, she like a fortune teller, right? And, and, and so because of that, they had Paul and Silas thrown in jail, and, 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 and then they start praising God at midnight, and then because of that, the, the doors opened, the chains fell off, and, and, and we, you know, it's a great story. But what happens is they, they walked out, and the jailer saw that, and the jailer thought, oh, no, I'm dead now, because Roman law, if you're a jailer and any of your prisoners left, it's a death penalty for you. That's why they take their jobs very seriously. It's major job security, right, to do well. And now they left, he thought. But actually, they were just going around to the other side, okay? 
And so he was about, he took the sword, about to do the Japanese thing, and, and then, but right before he did it, Paul says, stop, 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 you know, we're still here. And then he says, well, what must I do to be saved? And then he says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your household will be saved. Acts 16, 31, which is a promise in the Bible, and we all need to hold on to that, that our whole family will be saved. Amen? Okay? But then he got saved, and he was the first convert in this Philippi church. And many believe that he became a board member eventually, and he was the one who probably was the freeman who became the missions director. Because here we read in the book, the Philippians, that when Paul was in need, this church was the only church that provided for him financially. And that's why he makes the Philippians 4.19 proclamation, Je my, my God, Jehovah Jireh, will provide all your needs. Why? Because you are a true mission church. And he was a jailer who was probably, you know, spearheading all this. You know, hey, Brother Paul, he has a need. Come on, missions advisory team. We got to support him. There's no, you know, church board. We got to support him church we got to support them because if it wasn't for him we wouldn't even be in existence i wouldn't be saved today you see see the background here how powerful a mission trip can be what could happen in the future and yet paul when he was there he just did a few things and he moved on holy spirit did the rest and wherever you, god is leading you this year it could just be to plant a few seeds to speak a few words of encouragement to to some leader and who knows what they could do with because like I said, you get 10 times more Christian influence and education and inspiration than all the Christians in the third world. There's an opportunity here to invest in this. But here's the thing. Antioch, yes, was a giving church, as we already established. In fact, you know, some like to say they were the number one missions church of the Middle East Assemblies of God. Number one. Okay? What made them such a giving church is they thought and live mission. They thought and lived mission. Missions was their culture. Okay? Was their culture. In fact, some say that Philippi was a missionary cultural church. Philippi was a missionary cultural church. Let me read this last passage. Okay? I'm getting close to ending here. Philippians 2, 1 to 8. All right? I, I, my 40 minutes almost up, right? Start here. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, Remember, this is found in the book of Philippians. Okay, Paul is writing to this most missionary cultural church. Okay, so keep that in the in the mindset, in, in back of your mind as I'm reading this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have, you're going you're gonna to unders underscore something, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. He's talking to a, this, this Philippi church, okay, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. What was going on here? Philippi had the same mindset as Jesus. So Philippi wasn't just these Christians here. They weren't just thinking of going on a, on a missions trip, and then once it's over, it's over. This is a continual thing. They constantly thought mission. They constantly thought of others better than themselves. They're constantly thinking of ways to reach out to others. Constantly. Why? Because Jesus was like that. When he was on earth, you know, when did he ever take a vacation? When did Jesus ever have some pleasures for himself? Now, I'm just saying that, you know, we can do that. But he's an example for us. He's a model for us, okay? Sometimes we're a little bit too vacation-minded. Sometimes we're too leisurely-minded. And I'm, I'm, in, I'm all to take, we have to take breaks, we have to take the Sabbath, because that's in the commandment as well. But sometimes we're, we're too far over that way. This Philippi church is an example of a church that actually thought like Jesus. They culturally were missionary in mind. And the reason I'm saying this is because um, in our 2020 vision for this year, and even the name of today is called Going 2020. Okay? Going 2020, not just going in year 2020, okay? 
is going 2020 20 slash 20. You know, it's our theme this year, right? Doing mission with his mind, okay? And his mindset work is a continual thing. So what does that mean? It means that this year, we're going to be building a culture of mission. It's not just we go on a mission trip. And this is what I'm, I, I, I'm climaxing to say right now, okay, as, as we go into our whole missions program this year and all that, is that, is that missions is not just something that we do. Missions is something that we are. We are missionaries. The Great Commission is that disciples, and that includes all of us, go make disciples lifestyle. Missions is our culture. How's it, how does it relate to missions trips? Well, to show that, you heard a three months announcement, we have increased the subsidies for all the missions trips. You know, um, for, the, for, the, for the local one, I, namely San Francisco, we, we doubled the subsidies. Okay, it used to be 150, now it's 300. For the, for the international, it was 300. We increased that to, to, to four, 400, right? Yeah, so that's a 25 percent. Okay, was it 300? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Why am I wrong? Okay, okay. My math here. <laughs> I'm supposed to go over math. Yeah, yeah. 33 percent increase. Okay. Why are we doing this? Because we're investing in this culture of mission. Because we believe that the more people go on mission trips, the more disciples we are building as a team. And mission is one of the the the, the ultimate ways. To make a disciple. Ask the people who have been there for over a year. Okay? They had to do some of the pastoral stuff. They, they couldn't just rely on, oh, let's just ask Pastor so and so to help us out. There was no other. They were it. You know? I mean, a team of a team of of five adults, three children, had to do everything. They had to do all the greeting, the offering message, prepare the food, then prepare a setup, tear down, preach, uh, uh, Wash up, everything, right? Remember, remember those days, right, when you guys were there? You had to do it all, okay? Let me tell you, I don't hear them complaining about what us pastors don't do. How, because you know what? They've experienced it. They, they've been in our shoes. They know how hard, how hard it is to be a pastor, right? Amen, right? They know how hard it is to prepare a message just like that, you know, because they had to do all that stuff, right? They did it all, right? When you do missions, right? And um, so for is making disciples. They are becoming more disciples because of it. So going on a missions trip is, is, is an incredible way to make disciples. Going on a missions trip will not be a one-event experience. And I just want to say that really clearly, okay? Don't be thinking, oh, I'm only signing up for that one week and that's it, okay? If you sign up for the trip, you are actually signing up for an ex a missionary development experience. Okay, oh, really? A missionary development experience. Here's what's going to happen. Prior to going, there's going to be some pre-trip training. We've got three established. It's in the brochure. Uh, um, um, uh, um, um, there'll be more training that you'll have to attend. Um, and, and by the way, that's for everybody, even those who have been on the mission trip, because we, we revamped the training this year. Just because we're not just preparing for a trip, we're preparing you for a lifestyle. Okay? And so there will also be involvement in ministries here. We don't want, for example, you, you want to go to Thailand? There's a lot of children ministry in Thailand. Yeah, I saw, I was in Thailand in November. I saw all that. I was so, I was so blessed to see children on the stage leading worship. And they were good, right? And then they danced, and they were good, right? Because I couldn't dance, right? You know, and I was just so blessed by that. You're going to be involved. You go to Thailand, you will be involved in children ministry. Why are we not training you for children ministry before you go there? So what we're going to do is, now, again, part of Crystal's portfolio being the pastor of discipleship for this church is that she oversees our, our new and revamped BIM ministry, too. If you go to Thailand, she's going to recruit you to also help out with BIM ministry here at the church. Doesn't that make sense? You should be doing that here before you do it out there, right? The first time you do it shouldn't be out there, right? The first time you do a healing should not be out there. It should be here, right? Does that all make sense? So... We're building a culture here. We want to develop you here first. Our church will benefit from it. Locally, the, the community will benefit from it. And then we send you out, and then they will benefit as well. Does that make sense? Now, that's before the trip. During the trip, you'll be participating in missions activities. 
and, and, um, and then there will be time to reflect because we're going to ask you to write a journal. The reason for that is because, you know, and I still do it, by the way, just to let you know. I go, you know I go on a lot of trips. I write a journal on every trip. Now, I learned to do that on my first mission trip. But I even do it now because the things that happen out on the field that I don't want to forget. And even now, sometimes, to be honest, right, you know how I preach and I bring out all these illustrations all the time? You know a lot of it is because I go back on journal because, okay, remember, oh, when I, when I was in, in Israel, something happened on the third day. Oh, what was it? And then I turn my journal. Oh, that's what happened. That was a deaf person here heard and all that, right? And, and, that, and then I extract that, and then I, I put in my sermon notes, and that's, what, that's the story I'm going to tell. It's in my journal. But also, not just for preparing a sermon. Sometimes I go back and go, hallelujah. Lord, that's when I cried. Lord, that's when you moved upon my heart. That's when I said, I'm going to commit more of my life to you because of that one experience. See, something happened. But if you don't write it down, you forget. Right? I mean, we're all human, right? And I'm forgetting all sorts of things now that I think about it. You know? But when I write it down, it's there. I can look, I can refer to it, right? Reflection. And then the post-trip lifestyle, we're going to ask you, if you are to commit to a trip, that you are also willing to be more involved in ministry afterwards. Again, using the Thailand uh, example, you're going to do some stuff to help Crystal with children ministry in the church. You go there, you're going to be involved in children ministry. You cannot help it because those children wake up at what, five, five in the morning, right, Joe? Five in the morning to pray. And nobody told them to do that. They just do that. Right? I mean, some really spiritually charged children in Thailand, okay? You're going you're gonna to see all that. You're going to experience all that. But then when you come back, it's not a hallelujah trip is over now. No, 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 no. It's a cultural building. We're going to now, he's going to recruit you. He says, I need you to help out maybe once a month in children ministry. Or maybe for four or five, six months. You know, Because we don't want to just die right there. If God is making a disciple out of you, it doesn't just end when you come back. And you're in a local church where we're trying to reach out to the community. A lot of children around here. You need to reach out to them too. Or whatever ministry. I'm just talking about children right now. There's youth. There's there's church planting, Haleiwa, there's, there's HRC, our Hawaii Restoration Center. You know, there's a lot of things, okay? But the point here is that we, we don't want to just, all the focus on the trip and that's it. It's a before, during, and after. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you think that's a good approach? Okay. Well, you know, the leadership, we met together and we all, you know, going, amen, this is the right thing to do. And who knows what might happen? Who knows that maybe some of you might, might come to me and say, hey, Jay, I think I'd like to upgrade myself. I think I'd like to learn more of the Bible. Let's become Bible course that I could take. I, I, I don't know if I want to be a pastor, and maybe not. You know, but I just want to learn more about the Bible. Man, we're, we're, we're putting together this whole discipleship program. We also want to build up not just missionaries, not just short-term, but long-term, but also maybe even ministers. So people just, just want to learn more about the Bible. That's okay, too. Calling me not even be, to be a teacher, but you just want to learn more about the Bible. You know, we can, we can, we can, we can show you how to do that as well, you know. See, what will happen is that you will become a missionary in both Jerusalem and Israel. That's what we're doing. Okay? So it's a new approach. This is actually the first time that we're doing this. That's why even um, what I'm doing today is, 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 is totally brand new and everything. And um, so anyways, if you do decide, we're going we're gonna to prepare you spiritually, emotionally, physically, socially, financially, culturally, and ministerially. Okay? That will become with all the different trainings that are coming up. Okay? Um, and, and you can see that the benefits um, is that you will, you will realize your own potential. You'll grow. You'll be able to bless the people that you reach out to. You have a, more of a 2020 vision of the world and what God sees. And um, I, I, I'm really excited about what we're doing. Amen. Um, if you haven't, if, if you're planning to go on a missions trip, it's required that you read my book. Okay, it's fifteen dollars, and I'll sign it too. Then it's worth fifteen million dollars. I'm just kidding. You know, but but you know, hopefully you'll be blessed by that. Many of you have already read it, so it's okay. Okay, and then we we'll need a a book report from you. But I'll talk about it during the first uh, training. Okay, so I think I covered everything I wanted for now. All right, so sounds good. It's gonna be exciting. Twenty twenty vision going twenty twenty this year. Okay, brother. All right, we're going to have a 10-minute break, okay? We're going to be back at uh, 10.20, okay? Uh, we have some, uh, some uh, little uh, cupcakes in the back and some brownies, okay? Please help yourself over there. Please sign in right here, okay? We want to make sure that you attended the first session. And, uh, 
Okay, so 10.20, go for it. Use the restroom and eat some snack. 